Skulls, welcome. We're here at the Cricket Mentoring Headquarters, which is pretty cool in itself. And I think we probably got in contact about three or four years ago. Uh, found you on social media, really connected with the content that you're building, but to see how it's grown exponentially over the last few years is pretty cool. Um, but I think a lot of people don't see the amount of work that goes on behind the scenes. So it'd be really cool to get an insight. Firstly, like why, why start cricket mentoring as opposed to your regular face-to-face -face grinding of the coaching? And then what did it look like in those first two years compared to where it is now? Well, Barbie, thanks a lot for having me. And you've opened up a pretty big answer there because there's a, <laughs> there's a lot that it goes, it has sort of, I could answer that. There's a lot that's gone into it. But um, why, um, when I, so I first started just for like a lot of coaching, just for a little bit of extra income. Um, fortunate to be good friends with the guys at Muleman's who here in Perth have the cricket centre. And I was running around the river here in South Perth one day and I ran, in, ran past Scott Muleman, who was my former captain at Melville. And I just said to him, Oh, Scotty, I've just moved into Perth. I'd literally just moved into an apartment around the corner and and um, I said, oh, I'm interested in some coaching. And so that week um, I got a phone call from a parent who wanted some private coaching. The guys at Muleman sort of said, yep, here, you, this is our deal, um, whatever, whatever, pay us this amount. And I went to that session just wanting to sort of get a bit of extra income. I was working full time. I'd finished my career, professional career in England and I got so much enjoyment out of seeing a little kid put their sort of trust and the parent put their trust in me and this kid just sort of light up when he when something clicked and I sort of suggested something that I left there sort of really energized and wanting to do more and over the next few weeks um, I got a few more sort of clients and and then sort of upon reflection of my own career and not quite making it as a player myself and not reaching my own potential I I realized that it wasn't through a lack of sort of technical coaching it wasn't through a lack of hitting a lot of balls it was through a lack of my mental skills my emotional skills and understanding myself as a human being and so from sort of the very beginning I wanted to try and give more so even before cricket mentoring was sort of born in, in January 2016 we're sort of winding it back 18 months I was sort of creating these folders for players. I was printing out sort of articles off Cricket Info or off cricket.com about mindset. I was trying to create training plans and I was trying to just do more for these young players because that's what I feel like I was doing when I was their age. I was wanting. Um, so, yeah, it was, just, it was just a love of sort of looking at and seeing myself at, at, in these young people. It was all boys at the start, these young boys. I could see me being a 12-year-old and I was think I was about 24 back then or so. Um, 24, 25. So yeah, it was a real enjoyment. And then, um, yeah, sort of out of that, I had some mates say, oh, get me some coaching. And then someone said, oh, you should start a business out of this. And then the word mentoring was sort of, I was reading everywhere in the business world, in the sort of um, commercial world, but not in sport. It wasn't used very often in sport back then in sort of 2015. And then January 2016, I, yeah, I founded Cricket Mentoring. We didn't launch it um, until August because I was trying to get the perfect website and make everything legit to sort of go out to the world. And in hindsight, um, with what I know now and sort of the mindset I have now around not caring about people's opinions as much, um, I should have just launched straight away. But it was an eight-month process of getting photos perfectly sized and everything. And when we launched, it was a, it was a good-looking website thanks to my brother-in-law and who put a lot of hours in and. And yeah, here we are sort of five and a half years later. Um, we've, we've grown quite, quite well and, and we've got a small team. You've been a part of that team at times. You've come to India with us. Um, we've sort of really enjoyed having you a part of it. You headed up our female cricket here for a little while before we lost you to the East and, and to Ireland. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been a great journey. And, and in my opinion, we're still very young. We're still in the beginning and I've got some sort of big plans and hopefully we can continue to grow and continue to offer value to the cricket community around the world. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a lot now I want to unpack in that. Um, starting with, I suppose you, you mentioned, and I've heard you say a few times, I want to be the mentor I wish I had. So you as a 15, 16, 17 year old boy, what do you wish you had actually had at that age that potentially, you did play professional cricket in the end, but I'd pro probably similar as me, not as much as you probably wanted to. What do you wish you had when you were 17 that would probably have changed the, the outcomes down the track? Oh, it's such a great question. And it's just, I think it's a simple answer. For me, it's someone to talk to who knew what I was going through and could advise me and guide me what path to take in certain situations. So 
I had a very supportive, um, pa- I had very supportive parents, um, particularly my mum, who would sort of take me everywhere and support everything I did. When I was sixteen, I, I moved up, left home, and I moved to Darwin for six months, and I, I lived up with who now is my best mate, best man at my wedding, Ryan. Lived with his family to be part of the Northern Territory Institute of Sport program, and my parents sort of supported everything I did. But they didn't have a sporting background; they didn't know anything about cricket um, until I started playing, and. I just sort of wish I had someone older, a little bit wiser, who had been through something similar, didn't necessarily have to have played at the highest level or anything, but could say to me when I was feeling down, hey, this is just normal. Don't dwell on it. Don't stress about it. Just like learn and move on. And that's one of my biggest messages is that's normal. What you're going through is normal. Don't beat yourself up for that. And and that I didn't have. So um, it, it just would have been someone to talk to, someone to sort of um, pick up the phone and say, hey, I'm struggling a bit here. I'm struggling with this. What do you think I should do? And, and, and I think a good mentor doesn't have all the answers. I think that they're able to guide you to the right people or in, in this sort of day and age, the right content, the right podcasts or the right articles that can just give you some some learnings, but also some reassurance that you're, you're on the right path. And, and as you said, like I, I did sort of, I left home a week before I turned 18, came to Perth. I then sort of went over to England. I played professionally in England for a few years. So I'm really proud of my of my journey and doing it all alone. I had some sort of fantastic coaches. Um, I had some really great mates, but I didn't have that sort of really good role model um, who I could also just probe and ask questions of. And so that's sort of where this sort of business was born and, and what I keep referring back to that I'm trying to be the mentor that I wish I had. I think so many kids do have wonderful parents and, and parents who often come from a sporting background, but the kids at some point stop listening to their parents as well. So just trying to be that person on the outside of the family, on the outside of the system um, that can sort of be there to answer those questions that I wish I had. Yeah, John, fascinating. You did not mention technical or tactical or anything like really structured to cricket within your answer there. It was firstly empathy, relationship, mentoring, conversations and I really like how you mentioned it's the person not just outside your parents but outside the system so we have a lot of and particularly this podcast a lot of uh, cricketers that are in and around high performance setups whether it's underage or within squads and a lot are like well I'm meant to be perfect I'm meant to be in this high performance setup and which has all the resources and all the money or whatnot and you're like hang on so why is it that people still come to someone outside those outside those setups, and I think it's because of what you said. It's that constant relationship of not just my cricket, but who are you as a person? Because what happens when you find yourself on the outside of that system? Yeah. And then who cares for you? Yeah, exactly. And and for me, like uh, Teague Wiley, it's been well documented. He's one of my boys. He's like a little brother to me. I've I've sort of mentored him since he was 13, and he's now into the WA system. He's been in their system, in their pathway system, for some time now, but. Now that he's in the Wacker system, I can sort of take a bit of a step back and just sort of be there on the outside when he needs me. We still talk most days. He's away in Sydney at the moment and we text and he, he sort of sometimes sends me photos of his setup um, from the World Cup to a, a practice game at the Wacker and we discuss those sort of things. But like right now, he's got a fantastic coaching staff at the Wacker in Adam Voges, who's also a good friend of mine, and Bo Casson and Jeff Marsh. But what happens when Vogsy gets the next Australian job and Bo moves up and, and the, the, the system changes? Well, then who's there sort of looking after Teague? So for me, it's about supporting the individual. I think that those coaches in the system always have the, the team first, the, the system first. No individual is bigger than the system, obviously, um, or the team. But for me, it's about trying to really be that supporter on the outside and whether if Teague sort of goes and plays a Middlesex in England or goes like I'll be there for him whereas often the, the state coach stays with the state team and, and so forth the franchise coach stays with the franchise team so for me it's it's trying to build, build that relationship and it's it to me it's it's all about the long-term relationship when I first saw Teague as, at a, as a 13 year old I thought wow this kid could be amazing as I have with many others um, and I sort of see their, their long-term potential. And then I, for me, it's like I want to be on this journey with them. And hopefully Teague will be playing for Australia one day pretty soon, hopefully. And and I can be sort of part of that journey with him and beyond his cricket career. And we're, we're very good mates. He'll be turning 18 soon and I'll be having a beer with him when he turns 18. And, yeah, I'm really excited for that. And, and that's the case with many others as well. I've formed a good relationship with Jake Weatherald recently. And, again, he came to me because he wanted someone – outside the system to talk to and be vulnerable to and be honest to because you listen to a lot of athletes and I'm sure you've heard this before and and I know you felt this personally that it's bloody hard to be vulnerable to those that are deciding your career those coaches 
inside the system that are picking the teams. And if you say go to them and say I'm struggling with something, well, then they might be like, well, why would we sort of pick him if he's struggling against spin or struggling with this or not in a good place? So I want to be that person that they trust and they can be vulnerable to on the outside. Absolutely. And we'll get into the vulnerability side of things in a second. Um, but someone like Teague, you've... I think it was 13, is that when you first started coaching him? Yep. And he's gone through the roof, particularly the last six months, the Aussie World Cup, Jack Weatherall, there's, there's quite a variety, but you also said you've seen a few that are just as talented at 13. Um, and I've heard you say, and it's pretty common, is success leaves clues. What is it that you've seen with someone like Teague or the success, the people that actually transition that, yeah, he's talented or she's talented into performances? What are those clues? Well, this is a whole nother podcast because that, <laughs> that is opening another can of worms. Right. But, but um, I wouldn't, I, to be honest, I wouldn't say I've seen many who were in the place Teague was in at 13. When he, when I, it was a, it's sort of an interesting story I, I've told once or twice but not very many times that I, I sort of was trawling Instagram back when we were young as a business. I would look at all the scorecards. I still do that a bit now. Look at my cricket, look at the scorecards, look, find the name on Instagram and send them a message. And that's how you connect directly to the player. So I, I found Teague's name, it found his Instagram and he just won awards for under 13 d- district cricketer or something. So send him a message and I, I, him and his parents and I joke about it now. I'm very close with his whole family. His sister, George, is a very good cricketer. I coach her as well. And then his parents, John and Marnie, and they talk about how at first they were like, who's this creep messaging us on Instagram? <laughs> They saw us, saw our, our following and whatever. I offered them a free session just to come along. And from the first time I saw Teague, he, he was a very skilled 13-year-old. I, I don't like the word talent because I feel like, and I've got young daughters myself and I'm watching them develop. Um, his dad, John, had played cricket and Teague had grown up around cricket. And he tells a story where he hated cricket until he was about three or four, but he then spent so much time as a kid around cricket and hitting balls. So by the time he was 13... I probably haven't seen many cricketers yet that age who have the talent, not the talent, who have the skill that he had as a 13-year-old. So technically he was really sound. He was very well set up by his father and the principles his father aligned. But moving beyond that, I think the thing that has really, I think the thing that I've given him more than anything is a bit of belief. I've always tried to sort of, and he talks, we had him on our podcast last year, And he talks about a moment at a national carnival. I was coaching the NT side. He was playing for WA. We were in the lunchroom together. He was about to go out and pat. And I I just sort of, we had a little conversation. He then went and hit a boundary against the best bowler in the competition. He only made 10 or 15 that day. But that shot gave him the belief that he was good enough. He went on to score runs in the remaining, remaining games that tournament. And he got picked in the team of the carnival. And everything over the last three years has just been an upward spiral since then. So... I've often sort of made him see things and believe in things that maybe he hasn't. But the, the biggest thing about him is he just absolutely loves his craft. He loves batting. And, and I see so many resemblances to Marnus and Steve and, and sort of Elise and Meg Lanning and the best players who, who are just so dedicated to what they do. Um, and and he, just, he just doesn't ever want to get out. And so he's so hungry and he's smart. He's a really smart cricketer. He's always trying to take the, the low-risk option. So batting's a game of scoring runs. It doesn't matter how you look. It doesn't matter how you do it. And he's just found a method. He's developed this method that he's always taking low-risk options. So if he gets it wrong, it's not likely to get him out. He's become very smart. He's a student of the game. He's always watching things. He's looking at his footage back to learn. Um, so many, many things. But to me, it's the hunger and it's being a student of the game, being smart about how he goes about things. It's sort of fast-tracked him from being a, a skilled 13-year-old who lacked a bit of belief, got to 15, and then 15 to sort of almost 18 has just been incredible. Yeah, that's a really cool answer because it actually almost opposes, in a way, what I was almost preaching or my ideas when I started this podcast. My idea, and I, like, I'm probably pretty similar to Teague in the I just love the game, I love training, and I thought everyone did that. I thought everyone, I literally thought everyone worked their ass off and everyone pushes, and of course you do, like if you're passionate about something, like everyone trains. And the thing that separates the best from the rest is actually your mental and emotional skills. So a lot of like the inside edge was the whole point that it's actually already, like it's the inside that gives you the edge. Uh, but what I've come to realise now that I'm coaching more, I probably only started coaching significantly more in the last year or so, is that not everyone does that. Not everyone does the work (laughs) or has the passion to actually get better or it's the underlying motivation behind doing the work is tended towards what we call the external motivation. So it's about getting the contract or the amount of times I ask some of the kids around 
like in Melbourne where I'm coaching a lot of oh, like why are you work why, why do you want this why, why are you doing what you're doing oh I want the contract and you're like hang on a minute where is your answer about Teague just then yes obviously obviously you want to play professionally obviously you want to score runs but there's an underlying I just love cricket <laughs> like mm. I love the game I love working hard I love tinkering but loves batting love like batting. loves like, his art yeah and it's the actual skill itself that drives you and it's not only that there's always going to be a balance yep. um, but having that internal motivation balancing your external motivation I reckon is so so important absolutely and the thing that I think that allows him to do is enjoy doing the simple stuff and for me whenever I'm coaching whether it's Teague or it's a 10 year old or it's um, John Wells it all often comes back to the basics and trying to be have world class basics it's a term I've heard on the high performance podcast which I'm sure you've listened to and consumed but world-class basics which a lot of people who aren't world-class or aren't that good they think it's too it's be it's beneath them and they're not willing to spend the hours in the dirt just doing underarms to groove a technical little sort of issue or something and that's something that Teague's willing to do because he loves it he loves the the process of getting better and he loves just batting so if it's underarms and he gets to practice things he's, he's okay with that whereas others who like you say aren't as motivated internally and don't love their craft as much they get bored and they're like, no, nah, I want a challenge. I want something that's exciting. And then they're not going to progress as quickly. And that's another trait of Teague is he's happy to do the simple things. And how would you then – so we, we have a couple that I've been working with that outrageously talented, like love cricket, love playing, love competing. But say we had one girl who's really been struggling with the ball this year and sat down and said, all right, like, what, what, what are you working on at the moment? It's like, oh, what do you mean? Like, what are you working on with your, with your bowling? Like, like, we're trying to work out what's going wrong. It's like, oh, I bowl a couple of times a week at the Nets. And you're like, you're a one or two, three places away from a professional contract here. And you're not actively working on... And I said, you don't need to be adding... You don't be adding a douche row or an arm ball. It's like, when are you doing your brilliant basics? Or you, I think you call them daily vitamins. Daily vitamins, yeah. How often are you doing your daily vitamins? How often are you pushing your daily vitamins to be better and better and better at them? And the amount of people that don't do that astounds me yep and to me that to me I, I don't blame the player I think that's either that's sort of the system a bit but it's also a lack of guidance from the outside and that's where I think that's where I come in and our sort of business comes in is to say look I don't care about the sexy stuff you can go and do the sexy stuff and you can do the reverse sweeps the doosers and all that and we do practice reverse sweeps but it's after we've ticked the boxes of the brilliant basics and the daily vitamins of just your fundamentals doing your fundamentals well and I didn't quite understand that as a kid. I just did whatever I wanted to do because I was loved batting and I would go to the nets every day, but I just hit, hit, hit. And that volume got me to a decent place. But now with all of our players, it's like, let's tick our boxes with our vitamins and then we can expand and do all the extra stuff and whatever. So to me, you only know what you know. And, and it sounds like this young girl didn't really know what she should be doing. So, um, and, and I've got sort of, yeah, two of my great mates, Adam Vodas and Chris Rogers are head coaches and, and I speak to Buck especially a lot about the system and it's, you, you, you need good people in, in these sort of developmental roles that, that really do care about each individual and, and are trying their best to make sure, and everyone's just trying their best and they know what they know, but they're trying to ensure that the players are getting good guidance and trying to, yeah, develop good fundamentals. Yeah, absolutely. And that increases your potential, I suppose, your potential to perform. So I'm sure you've heard the inner game of tennis equation, which I use a lot, is your performance. It's probably in, yep, one, of it's in one of these books over here somewhere. <laughs> the inner game of tennis. There you go. There it is. So the, the primary thing, like equation they use is performance is potential minus interference. Yep. Um, and I really like the word potential there. So it's not so much what you could reach in 10 years' time because no one actually knows that. And I love, I don't know if you heard Johnny Wilkinson on the High Performance Podcast, but yep. he talks about potential being how good you can be in this moment. Mm. So be the best you can be right now. Mm. So your potential is, so for those that haven't heard it, your potential is effectively what's the best you can be right now. And you build your potential through what we've just spoken about, physical training, technical, tactical, but then there's the interference piece. So the number one question I've had, and I'm sure it's the same for you, is why can't I transfer what I do in training into a game? And that comes down to what they call interference. From your perspective and what you've seen, what are the biggest factors that create interference? Well, as, as you're alluding to, it's, it's all stems from your thoughts. And to me, it's a, it's a worry of and the outcome. 
So in a cricket sense, and this goes across all sports, but in a cricket sense, in the nets, it's a controlled environment and there's no consequences. Yes, we can have live nets and we can do centre wickets or whatever, but 99% of the time when we train, we play a big drive, we nick off, we throw the ball back, we keep batting. We keep, get to do, get, we keep getting to do what we enjoy, what we love, and that's batting. Or you bowl a wide or bowl a bad no ball, bowl a wide, but there's no consequence. We get to a game, it's a completely different environment. And cricket is such a ruthless game. Batting is such a ruthless game where you make one mistake and your day can be over. And it can be over for a week or two or sometimes even three. You might not get another hit in grade cricket for three weeks. So all of a sudden the stakes become so high that we we sort of often, and and most people tell ourselves this fear story of don't stuff it up, don't ruin this chance I've got. And that creates a level of anxiety, that creates a level of tension in our body through the story we're telling ourselves. So we then, that's interference. We then can't see the ball, make a good decision and move our body and execute our skill as well as we can when there's no interference at reach our potential when we're sort of playing with freedom. So to me, it's like freedom sits on one end and fear sits on the other. And you don't have to fear fear. You can embrace fear and enjoy the sort of the, the feeling and the emotion that you get when you get into that state. And that actually can help you. I I played my best cricket towards the back end of my career when I had nerves and I had a bit of anxiety because it gave me an extra sense of focus that I needed. Often in the back half of my career, when I didn't have that, I I probably didn't care enough and then I wasn't ultra focused. So if we can change the story in our head and a lot comes to being okay and accepting the outcome, accepting that it could go wrong and it's possibly going to go wrong, probably going to go wrong, well, then that allows us to play more on the freedom end where our best cricket lives. So the interference is all stemmed from the story we're telling ourselves and the perception we have about what the outcome means. Yeah, that's so good. And that story you're telling yourself, though, it's easier said than done when you say, oh, we're just going to accept that we're probably going to fail in a game of like cricket. Like, you, you are actually probably going to fail. <laughs> um, but there's a difference between... But I'd also like to say, like, fail is a word I don't particularly yeah. like to use. Like, it's... It, to me, I, I love the saying that you've only failed when you give up. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, you might make a mistake and get out. But that, that, to me, isn't failing. That's an opportunity to say, all right, wasn't my day. Or you might make a mistake and get out when you're 150. But it's an opportunity to learn. So I, I partic- try and change the language. I think that in coaching and mentoring, language is incredibly important because every word we say has some sort of meaning and context. So... I try not to say you failed, but um, yeah, keep going. Sorry to <laughs> no, cut you off there. No, that's perfect. So it's like, well, it depends on, again, that's the story that you're telling yourself. So you're, t- you're telling yourself one story about su- what success is or failure is and another story is what is success and what is failure. Um, but for me anyway, and I reckon a lot of people have spoken to, there's, there's often two narratives running. So there's one which is a little bit more ego-based, which is failure is not scoring runs and success is scoring runs and then there's another narrative which is your conscious mind or your trained mind that you might be hearing your, your mentor you might be hearing skulls in your head and be like no failure is an opportunity to learn um, success is actually concentrating 100 percent a ball at a time even if i get a duck um, how do you then train that so how do you train yourself to enter voice b which is rewriting that ego-based story as opposed to A, which goes off on tangents? Well, I think it's first thing I'll say is it's not a quick fix. It's not like you can just come and do one session, you wake up the next day and you've completely changed your outlook <laughs> on life. Because to me, it's a, it's a whole outlook. It's not, just a, like, it's not just a mental skill, it's an outlook. So I think that A, starting from a point, and I say this to my athletes, if, like, if my daughter wants to get into cricket, the first thing I'm going to say the first thing I'm going to say is, am I allowed to swear on this podcast? Yeah, absolutely. I do it all the time. Is <laughs> cricket and batting is fucking hard. Yeah. So that will be the underlying message that I say at the very beginning. That's yeah. going to underpin everything that ever sits on top of that. So that hopefully her expectations of what success and failure is aren't unrealistic. And she knows that if she makes a mistake, it's not fatal and she's got an opportunity to learn. So crick- batting is hard. Cricket's hard. So then... I, I think that it's all about trying to just be, be kind to yourself and learn as you go um, and, and not judge yourself harshly when you do make mistakes because human beings make mistakes. It's part of like who we are. So it's not a process where you just go, right, I'm going to go from here to here. It's like really trying to on a daily basis catch yourself. I think it's about having awareness of your thoughts 
and catch yourself. But a lot is tied up in your identity as a person. And this comes back to sort of Ben Crow's work, which, which I know you're a huge fan of, as am I. And when I first heard it, it was really profound. And, and I sort of now teach it to my athletes around not defining yourself as a human being by your outcome as a, as a, as a sports person. And, and he talks openly about the work he did with Ash Barty. And, and I love those stories. I've shared them with our players. And so I try and encourage our players and it's much much easier said than done but try and encourage them to realize they're more than just a cricketer that that's just what they do but it's not who they are and if they can come from a place of not defining their whole identity as a human by their results well then they're they give themselves more permission to make mistakes whereas when i was young i've always had a positive optimistic outlook on life but i um i haven't like I still get down on myself and I wish I didn't wasn't so I, I didn't so identify myself so much with the outcome of my cricket because at the end of the day it's a, it's a leather ball with a, a bit of wood and whether we hit it or not doesn't make us a more valuable or less valuable person than if we don't so um, if you can if you can get that identity piece right and you do that around sort of identifying other things you you value in life you're good at in life and why people love you for who you are and not just because you hit a ball or bowl the ball well well then it gives you sort of space to fail and or make mistakes and not be too critical to yourself yeah absolutely and uh, i love that you said at the end and gave some actual tools and tactics because if i I was going to play devil's advocate in a second but you already answered my question (laughs) in that okay so take Teague or myself as an example, you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing you're thinking about cricket? All right, now I've got to go to training. I go on social media, everyone's message, I score runs, everyone messages me. I don't score runs, nobody messages me. And all of a sudden, my whole external world is now around my performances and cricket. Plus, add in the fact that I I just love the game, so obviously I want to do more of it. Um, So the ability to actually get yourself, to get that perspective of being the human that plays cricket is really difficult but like some of the tools you mentioned there is like work out well what are other things that I like how do other people value me what is my life story what are some other things that I really want to achieve with my life are really cool ways to actually build that perspective and and to go a little bit deeper on that I think trying to build a, a circle of people around you your inner sanctum that love you and care about you regardless of your cricket is crucial because if you've just got hanger honors who only are there when you're doing well, well, then who's going to help you when you're struggling? And so I think it's really important that you have a really... And that's where, like, Teague was on a, a radio interview in Perth, and I was listening to it again last night. I've, I sort of downloaded it. We're doing a bit of content around him at the moment. And he said that, oh, I, I love Skulls. He's the first person to message me whether I have a good or a bad day. And he can he knows that I'm a consistent... I'm consistent to him whether he's scored 100 in the World Cup or whether he's got a, his third duck in a row in a grad and we're still talking that night so i think just to go a little bit deeper it's it's identifying your values as a human but trying to get people around you and they're the ones that really matter because everyone else will always have an opinion one thing as human beings we can't control is other people's opinions we can try and be good people but if someone sees us at our worst moment they might think we're a bad person or whatever so we can never control other people's opinions and all that should really matter and i think this is a really important message is trying to be a good person for those in your inner sanctum and, and really value their opinion of you because all the rest is external noise once you've got a really good, tight inner sanctum. Yeah, have you heard of um, the square squad, the term? So it's, I think it's potentially a Brene Brown thing, but I might be wrong. So if you get a sticky note, you fold it in half, fold it in half again, so you've got a small square and you write down whatever, so you can probably only fit five names on that, and that's your square square squad. So it's not about, so there's the faux pas idea if we have other people's opinions. It's not about not caring what anybody thinks, but the way you have your values and your principles, the way you want to go about your life, it's those people, and they're the people that exactly are good or bad day, they're supporting you. They care about who you are as a person. Some some of them might be people that give you a kick up the ass. The others might be like, no, no matter what, they give you positivity but that's your square squad mm. and they're the only people that you, you do care about their opinions and you do actively seek their opinions. Um, but anyone that's not on that little quarter of a sticky note, irrelevant. Yeah, wow, well, yeah. like it. Yeah, I found that really... really and, and I think that really fits in with the idea that we are the sum of the five people we spend yeah. the most time with. And I can't remember who said that. It's a really famous sort of thing and it's something, again, that I preach to and, and try and teach to our younger athletes is 
be really protective of who you're spending your time with. If you're hanging out with Deros and Dropkicks, well, you're more than likely going to become one of them. And if you've got ambition, if you want to be a great athlete, you want to be a great sports person, well, you want to be trying to hang out with great athletes and great sports people. Surround yourself with people who sort of take you closer to where you want to be because you, we don't even realize, especially when we're young, I'm sure you've got a few younger listeners, 15, 16, 17, even younger. If you don't have the right people that you're spending lots of time with, well, then you need to find a new inner circle because that, that will, we are the sum of who we spend the most time with and you want to be something, well, then spend time with those sort of people. Yeah, absolutely. And if we start to break that down, so speaking of someone that's 15, 16, um, or even older, it doesn't really matter. So if you're building towards, and I do this in season, so I don't think it really matters whether it's right at the start of pre-season or in season, but it's almost like developing a plan for yourself to improve as a cricketer but as a person as well. And you've got your six pillars of success, uh, which are technical, tactical, physical, mental, emotional, and lifestyle. Well like. done. Did uh, your research. Did my research. Um, do you sit down with your athletes and work through each of those pillars in terms of, all right, say it's May in Australia, so we've got three months of pre-season before we head into the season. What are our goals? How do we achieve them through those pillars is that how it would work Br- to be brutally honest yeah. until now we haven't done it as well as we should have yeah. we're, we're in we're sort of recording this um, at the end of the cricket season and so we're in a, a, a real planning phase at the moment I've spent some time I've invested in a business coach and I'm spending some time with him today and something that we're working through is how can we offer more depth to our more serious athletes we've got a number of athletes from very beginners six years old right through to John Wells, who's playing in the Big Bash, Josh Philippi Teague, all these elite players and everything in between. But the, the primary client that we have is your 14 to 17-year-old who has real aspiration and they have parents who are willing to fund and support their aspiration for their children. So I said this to, I've said this to a few parents recently. We're having end-of-season sort of reviews and meetings and we're trying to plan for the winter. And we're, I'm being very transparent with the parents and saying, look, we're going to change our business model a little bit the, the, the norm for a cricket session is that you come into the nets and we hit lots of balls, and, and that's fine. For these age, that age group, I think that we've got to spend a lot of time on the technical pillar because that's where they're forming their technique. And in my opinion, technique certainly isn't everything, but if you don't have good fundamentals, you have a limit to how far you go, um, especially in the men's game where the bowling is much faster, and if you've got flaws in your technique, you'll get found out. Um, slightly different in the women's game where it's a bit slower and you can get away with little kinks. But generally, as a general rule, if your technique has flaws. So we spend do spend a lot of time on the technical, but the comfort zone becomes just hit balls, hit balls, hit balls. And what, what I think we do, and, and we do quite well, is we, we do talk a lot about what's happened on the weekend, what they learnt from it, um, and then oh, how you're feeling. We try and touch on the mental and the emotional, the tactical pillars but we don't do it until recently. We don't do it well enough, in my opinion. So Reedy and I have spent our time, Blake Reed, who's our senior mentor here, we've spent our time in the last few weeks trying to redefine what we want to do and how we want to help these people. We're having conversations with parents. I had a parent on the phone for half an hour the other day telling me about how his very good young son, who's highly ambitious, works really hard, but the night before a game, goes to bed late, gets up, doesn't eat anything, doesn't drink anything, and he bats at midday and gets out early and he's not... He, there's no reason, like, he's not looking after himself in his lifestyle pillar, sleep and hydration and diet, to then be able to go and perform. And his dad's sort of pleading with me to upskill him on those things. So to be honest with you, um, we, we do sort of planning sessions. We do winter planning and then pre-season planning. Um, and we offer our camps, which we've had you come and, and be involved in with our, at our female camp, where we try and go deeper with, in group sessions on the, each of the pillars. But we do get caught up a little bit too much just on the technical, tactical in the nets, but that's going to change. We're going to be really saying too, we're going, going to go out to our clients over the next couple of weeks. We're just redefining everything at the moment, replanning. We're going to go out to our clients and say, look, we've realised we haven't been going deep enough into certain things and we're going to actually once every month, we're going to instead of being in the nets, we're going to want you to come into the office and we're going to review your footage from a match and we're going to talk about your – all games are streamed now on Frogbox, which we've never really had before, even under 14s, under 15s, district level, and we've not had that opportunity before. So we're going to watch you bat in a game from your last three innings and we're going to sort of talk about what you're actually doing in a game because, as we've said, the nets to a game is very different and we only get to see them in the nets. So – 
The next session, two sessions might be in the nets on technique. And then we're going to be doing some group mental skills sessions, which more often, rather than waiting for the school holidays and doing stuff then. So we, we, we are a business. We call ourselves Cricket Mentoring. We're more, we are more than coaching. And, and for our online clients, it's, it's often uh, more about the mental and emotional. And for our better clients, someone like Teague now, I throw him lots of balls. We do a little bit of maintenance on his technique, but on a day-to-day basis, it's just talking about what he's learning, how he's feeling, what he's doing, da 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 things about him as a person. Um, but we're definitely moving more now. Now that the business is more established, we've sort of had a chance to sit back and say what's working, what's not. We're going to be going much, much deeper moving forward into all of the six pillars. Awesome. And the mental and emotional, what do you define as a difference between those two pillars? I think they're very linked. So we've just separated them to try and show that they are slightly different, but they're interconnected. Like for me, what we think determines how we feel. I think there's science that says you can be emotion led or you can be thought led. But in my experience, what we think determines like our mood and and our sort of feelings. I know that if I think about something that I should be doing or I haven't done or I get stressed, I start to sort of break out in a sweat quickly and it's all stemmed from my thoughts. So they're very much connected, but we might subconsciously be thinking about like the outcome or like we're sort of stressed about like something and we start to like get um, like that feeling in our stomach or a bit emotional. So uh, it's it's hard to sort of separate them because they're so connected. Um, And you might have a better answer than me on this, but um, for me, it's just, I, I try and encourage our athletes to understand our feelings, not fear the sort of emotion and the feelings that come, but understand them and then manage thoughts, try and fo- manage your attention, manage your focus, because that will then re-trigger and redirect your emotion. Yeah, well, I think the typical psych model is uh, beliefs, thoughts, actions. It's like an inter- they're, they're a circle. Um, I know Pete Clark, actually, I think it might have been on your podcast rather than mine, where he talked about um, how the, it's actually a circle and they all inter- intersect with each other. Um, my model's very similar but slightly different in that I just go body, mind, spirit. Um, a little bit more zen and wanky with the spirit side of things, but I think what I like, so body is your effectively technical, tactical, physical, um, or tactical comes into mind is routines, like actual in game, um, but it's also then understanding your thoughts, mindfulness, redirecting, all that sort of stuff. And spirit for me is that in a kid and that's probably with inside edge a lot of my coaching started out with helping players with the spirit side of things so if they're around my age it's trying to rediscover that in a kid because my story was got too caught up in body and mind and forgot about the joy and the playfulness and it probably goes back to that ash Barty, mojo crow stuff where your spirit is who you are your very core it's it's all of you in this moment and then it's also accessing that extra level so the flow state whereas you can only get to a certain point thinking your way through things Um, and that's what makes spirit different to mind it's about almost that letting go surrender deep humility at the end of the day as you said it's a bat and a ball do you really think that you know i said this it sounds harsh but i say this to quite a few it's like do you really think the universe or the world cares if if you get a duck this weekend do you really think it matters and to an extent it sounds pretty ridiculous but you can go into big world events in the grand scheme of things they're actually so small mm. i said that to a player last night who was stressing over how well he was hitting his cover drive hitting one or two in the air i said and then he sort of said oh my bat is just tapping and it's it's sort of hitting my pad as i go down i said mate if you spend a day in ukraine right now i don't think bat like and i sort of went there i was like mate this is not a big deal stop making it a big deal like try and smile and have some fun and and fun is part of our values at cricket mentoring it's one of our core values and we don't sort of discuss that in our six pillars of success, but you've got to have fun. Like it, life's too short not to have fun. And that's something that I'm really, really big on. So I love your, yeah. your spirit piece. Yeah. And I think it's joy again. I, I reference Johnny Wilkinson all the time and he's got his own pod now too, which is unbelievable. So he um, talks about joy and what is joy. So you can go to someone who loves getting in the weeds and focused, laser focused and say, no, mate, just smile. It's like, no, but that's not, like that's not me performing at my best I like to actually have a little bit of ticker or some some like to we had Charlotte Edwards on the pod a couple of weeks ago and she talked about she used to pick like kind of Michael Jordan Hmm. pick a fight with someone and it's like well that's not smiling and laughing but joy is actually like getting in the weeds like being so present and focused and like in the moment in the flow and that can be joy too absolutely Um, but it's joy with that's a curiosity piece not so much I have to get this right 
And I reckon that's kind of the difference. Yeah, and, and one of our values or what we say we want our cricket mentoring athlete to be and one of the most important is curious because I think so many young athletes and, and humans, we judge ourselves and judgment often doesn't help. Like uh, we have a player like hit a ball and they go, oh, that was good. Yeah, I'm feeling good. I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I'm a good player. And next ball, they miss hit one and they often go, oh, and often when it's good, they undervalue it. And when it's bad, they overvalue it and they get really down on themselves because they made a mistake. So one of my biggest things I say to players is let's just be curious, try and understand why, what happened? Why was one good and one not bad? Don't beat yourself up for minor mistakes and, and judge yourself. So for me, yeah, that's a huge part of like what we do is just trying to be curious because that's where we learn. Yeah, and I heard something the other day and it was like the irony of perfectionism is that it's the number one roadblock to success because if you're constantly getting distracted by the outcomes, of course, you're not going to actually improve. Mm. So to be in the process, so like everyone says it, process, not the outcome, but what does that actually mean? What does that look like? And going into detail, well, it's, it's curiosity, it's humility, it's not being judgmental about whether you're not hit a good ball or not. It's like, well, how do I get better? Let's go again. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think that going back to your piece about Charlotte Edwards and getting in the weeds, a lot is to do with self-awareness. Like I, I, a few of my good mates, Chris Rogers, Sam Robson, who Sam played for England, obviously everyone will probably know Chris Rogers, um, they were ultra competitive when they batted, when they batted. But And like Robbo could almost like flick a switch when he'd go, even in the nets, he was ultra competitive, ultra focused. But outside of that, they were jovial, jokey, have a bit of fun, take the piss, sort of. But but they were able to switch that that flick that switch and and like yeah others like Teague he's very sort of quiet and focused he doesn't talk much when he's batting um, so just trying to understand yourself as well for me as I got older I wanted to try and be as relaxed as I could be so I wanted to talk to the umpire if I wanted to like I, sometimes I'd have a chat to the opposition or whatever but when I when I then had to face the ball I would try and switch myself back into that competition mode so. Everything in life, I think, comes back to self-awareness, trying to understand ourselves as per- people and who we are and what makes us tick and what makes us perform at our best as an athlete. Um, and then, yeah, our strengths and weaknesses and building our sort of game plans around that. Yeah, that's a really good point, the awareness piece. Uh, have you heard of the alter ego effect? Mm, no. Oh, you would love that. I'll, I'll get the book. It's by Todd Herman. He's a performance coach as well, and he uses a lot of... So basically, as humans as kids we play we create we're creative we imagine we do all the fun stuff when well, i'm seeing players. that right now with my three and a half year <laughs> old yeah actually perfect example pay attention to your toddlers i've got a little nephew who's just over one and they create like he's not speaking yet but you can just see how fascinated he is every day he comes over it's the same house did the same stuff and the same toys and he's fascinated by that golf ball that he's just picked up and it's pink instead of yellow or <laughs> mm. whatever it is um so kids have that ability to stay present um but they're also incredibly imaginative and we talk a lot about fun and play and joy when you're out in the middle well it's just being that inner kid again to a point but at the same time we've got all this baggage as adults um so what todd herman does is he his theory is that one we're naturally imaginative two it is too hard sometimes to let go to just let go of your insecurities everyone has as i said you you have now about your business about everything everyone has those insecurities so rather than fighting them you just create an alter ego now what's in your alter ego it's um you at your best so go to the mike Hussey thing go back and look at your best performances what did you look like what did you set what did you eat what did it feel like what were your acting uh, actions thoughts behaviors fully work out who are you at your best and then create an actual character around it. So there's loads of athletes that do something similar and you have a trigger. So when you say who I am when I'm playing is not who I am. So I'm like pretty cruisy, pretty, I'm actually quite, I'm the opposite. I'm actually quite serious and quiet off the field. On the field, I'm like, I almost pretend I'm West Indian. And you can create, it can be a lion. It can be, if you want the courage piece, you're actually pretending you're a lion. And it's that imaginative. So it says Clark Kent, Superman. Is Superman the real one or is Clark Kent just the one that dresses up the Superman? Superman can't function in everyday life. So put your Clark Kent on clothes for daily life and it is a part of you. So it's not that you're making something that's not part of you. Mm. That, that Superman is a part of you. So if you're someone that wants to like get in the contest and pick a fight, 
that's that's part of you. Mm. There is a part of you that is ultra competitive. So mm. let's create a character around it, and you step into it. So he talks a lot about a trigger. People that he's coached put playing cards of like superheroes in their pockets, or and put a band. So someone he had a army guy actually. So the army guy has come and he said he's a superintendent, but he wanted to be a really good dad. So he needed to create an alter ego around being a good dad. So every time he walked in the front door, he'd have a wear his keys, put his keys down, pick up a little bracelet. As soon as he put the bracelet on, he was no longer an army bloke. He was a dad. What does a dad look like? What does it feel like? So it's just different personality. Yeah, a little sort of compartmentalizing and, and characters. And I'm sure you did. You watch Save the Last, uh, not Save the Last, the Last, the Last Dance, Dance with yeah. Yeah, and Steve Kerr, who's now the yeah. famous coach and for the Warriors and whatever, very successful coach. He said in one of the episodes how he pretended to be someone else, and that day he just had his best ever day because he was he was no longer internal and constantly mm-hmm. thinking about what he's doing, and he was more external and just trying to like pretend to be someone else and it just all clicked for him so i think that creating that alter ego that sort of persona that character or whatever and then and then stepping into it when you need to is wonderful and kobe bryant the black member he he used to he he used to be a, a very humble kind beautiful person but on the basketball court he was ferocious he was competitive he was due to win at all costs but he could compartmentalize and separate himself and he he gave himself that name i think or or think so, yeah. um to sort of be able to step into that character so yeah especially for for really nice gentle people i think it's probably a really good um piece of advice to potentially create this competitive sort of um character because you don't have to be you can be a nice person but you don't have to be that on the cricket field a lot of the time you can sort of be someone else who's doesn't want to lose and really competitive and, and that, if that brings out your best yeah and the other side of it is that it's easier to then separate who you are as a person as an athlete and I know he used Todd Herman's big example is Bo Jackson and he said well Bo Jackson never played a game of NFL or baseball in his life it was I can't remember the name of his alter ego mm. so then it's like oh when I step off nah yeah whatever my alter ego Black Mamba performed terribly today but Kobe's good yeah wow that's good I like <laughs> so that it's, yeah it's that's really little, cool not everyone likes it I know a lot of people that don't like the idea of faking something but mm. I don't think it is I think it's channeling different yeah, definitely. Yeah. And Shane Warne, I think, was the, the, the great late Shane Warne, um, was so good at that, that regardless, he had scandals going on, he had all sorts of issues going off the field at, at times, and he was just so good at stepping on and not letting it affect him. So the greater you become, the more eyes that are on you, the more expectation that's on you, the more pressure that becomes, and you want to be able to perform regardless of what's going on in the rest of your life. So having some sort of character or persona could help with that. Yeah, absolutely. And we might move towards our final questions, otherwise we could be here forever talking about all the stuff we, we love to talk about. Um, one question that I do want to ask you, because I know we mentioned it already, the High Performance Podcast, uh, is the question that they start with, and it is, what is high performance to you? Oh, good question. Um, and she hasn't warned me on this, so I've got no, to think I about haven't. it. But <laughs> to me, it's, it's trying to get the most out of yourself. Like I think I just had a conversation, a coaching call with a 19-year-old in Canada and he was sort of saying that he, um, he's not where he's not in the Canadian under-19 side. And he, he sort of sent me this document prior to the call. It was our first session together and he filled me in on his background. He was born in Bangladesh. His family moved to Canada when he was 11. His parents didn't speak English and he didn't know that there was cricket in Canada and he never played for six years. So at 16 or 17, he started playing again. And I said to him that you, your expectations, it's, you, it's your journey. It's your sort of story, your journey. It's really unrealistic to expect to be where a 19-year-old is just because your age is the same. You haven't put the level of um, time into your career just by your circumstances. So I said to him, you've got to redefine what your sort of success is. And for me, high performance or success is trying to get the most out of yourself, trying to be your best in every moment that you can possibly be in. It's not possible to be your best. I think we all have downs, we all have struggles, and it's it's accepting that and trying to sort of grow from that and learn from that so that we can be better and stronger next time and in the future when we're confronted with that again. So a long sort of ish answer, but I think it's trying to be your best as often as you can be. Oh, I love it. And 
another thing is we are we do have a lot of people that listen that love sport, love cricket, but are also in workplaces or moving towards a business aspect. Out of all the various topics we've talked today, what do you think you found the most useful in terms of helping you perform in a business setting as well? I think it's probably trying to learn. Like I, I, I'm a, I say to people, I'm a cricketer who's trying to run a business. I'm trying to learn how to do this business thing. And I make a lot of mistakes and it, it, I'm, try, I'm, I'm good at being kind to myself along the way. I, I, I sort of, I have 50 things on my to-do list and I might get one done in a day and then I could go home and, and stress and beat myself up. But I, I have an underlying mindset that I'm just doing my best. I'm just trying to do my best. I'm trying to do whatever's the most important thing in this moment. Um, and, and I'm trying to learn as I go. I'm, I'm trying to, like I went for a run around the river this morning. I was listening to a podcast as I went. I, I listened to the radio or a podcast when I'm in the car. Uh, I've got some really fantastic mentors I'm trying to learn from, both in a business sense and in a cricket sense, in a coaching sense. So um, I think it's just like always trying to learn. Like I don't know everything and I certainly don't know a whole lot about business. Um, and so I don't think there's one sort of answer. It's just trying to always be open to new ideas, new things and, and try things. I think that like you'll never know if you don't try things. Um, you've got to obviously test ideas and not every idea is a good idea, but um, you've got to be in it to win it and you've got to make mistakes to then sort of learn. And so, yeah, and, and we certainly haven't done everything like people might look from the outside and say, oh, you're killing it. Whatever. We certainly haven't done everything as well as we could have. We could be going way better in, in many aspects if we'd done things slightly differently. But that's part, of, that's part of the journey. That's part of being a human. That's part of life, not just business. Brilliant. And the final question that we normally ask is about who you are at your best. And we're not talking about so much externally in terms of running this big business or all of the external things. It's just who are you? Who is Tom Scholle at his very best? Um, good question. I love it. Um, I think it's pretty simple. I think generally I'm very distracted. I'm very, my wife and I have some issues at times because I'm so connected to my phone. I'm so connected to my business. And, and so at my best, I'm present. I'm really present and I'm happy. I'm, I'm fun. I, I'm just involved in the moment. And, and it's probably, it's a really good question because it probably makes me think that I'm probably don't get to that as often as I'd like to, because I'm so caught up in what I'm doing, um, not who I am. So I think I'm at my best when I've got people around me that I care about, whether that's my family, my daughters, my wife, or my closest friends. Um, and I'm just, just enjoying life. I'm enjoying, I get energy off other people. I enjoy trying to give energy to other people. So I think it's, it's all around being present and not like letting external worries or future worries about the business or anything like that get into my psyche that sort of zaps my energy a bit so I'm highly energized and I'm really present. Brilliant and Skulls I think what you've built here at Cricket Mentoring and the conversations that we've the conversation we've just had I think exemplifies everything that you've spoken of you're actually living and breathing exactly that you're living and breathing being curious learning making mistakes going again your last our last two to three minutes just shows that you're not just preaching this stuff you're actually living and breathing it so thanks so much for coming on the podcast I'm truly inspired by what you've done and as someone trying to venture into the business world too I didn't realize how hard it actually is but to see you coming through and I'm sure there's so much down the track for cricket mentoring um thank you for everything you're doing and thank you on. yeah thanks for having me I appreciate it and hopefully there's a little bit of value in there and um yeah, I just think you just got to ha- you got one life, so have a crack and try and have some fun along the way. So thanks for having me. Brilliant. Thanks for tuning in. If you want to continue to be part of the Inside Edge project, hit subscribe or leave a comment below. We're also on all major social media platforms. I look forward to having you along next time.